Okay, hello, um, Papak Marty, please turn your video on and we are about to start. Uh, good afternoon, Jakarta time and good morning to those who are in Moscow and other relevant time zones. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, ASEAN Center is happy to announce the start of a new series of online lectures titled ASEAN Academic Days 2021 in Gimor. And our first guest lecturer is Dr. Martina Taligava, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia in 2009-2014, and also a prominent Indonesian diplomat. So currently, Dr. Taligava is a member of the UN Security General's High-Level Advisory Board on Mediation and he offered a number of academic publications and articles on international relations, on the situation in the region, ASEAN, and the geopolitics economy nexus. One of his recent books uh, is the one we particularly uh, love, is Does ASEAN Matter? A View from Within. And we are very privileged that uh, Papak Marty agreed to share his views on ASEAN and the current situation today. We have almost 200 uh, registered participants from 16 countries. I counted this morning Russia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, Singapore, Vietnam, Myanmar, India, Nepal, Belarus, the UK, Denmark, Bulgaria, Israel, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. I don't know whether all of them are following us right now or are they uh, looking at us via YouTube um, uh, transmittance. But uh, that's the fact. And we received more than... 40 questions, which is, uh, I think, a sign of interest to the topic and to the speaker. And before I pass the floor to the distinguished uh, speaker, let me briefly remind you all of the house rules. So please, those who are online, please keep your mics muted. And those who are here in the room, please do the same. Um, we start uh, the lecture part, and then the Q&A will follow afterwards. Um, so... That's generally the plan. Bapak Marty, thanks for joining us, for finding your time, and the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Well, th thank you very much uh, indeed, Dr. Kolunova. I'm, I'm extremely uh, delighted and pleased that I should be having this opportunity uh, to communicate once again with our friends at the MGIMO. And this time, as you have uh, quite rightly described, uh, we have. Uh, friends who are following uh, the, uh, the discussion uh, elsewhere uh, beyond the campus. I think this is one of the wonderful feature of uh, technology nowadays that we can have a even more inclusive and expansive uh, uh, discussion forum. Uh, I am extremely uh, delighted as well to acknowledge the important contribution that the ASEAN Center has made at the MGIMO in promoting ASEAN awareness in Russia, as well in promoting uh, awareness of Russia uh, in the ASEAN uh, capitals as well. The, I have been asked this morning, I mean, this morning, your time, this afternoon, uh, Jakarta time, to share some thoughts and hopefully to have some discussion uh, with you all on a subject matter which is uh, rather dear to me and which I think is rather important, uh, namely the theme of uh, changing, changing regional dynamics and ASEAN, uh, especially does ASEAN matter? Uh, that is actually the question that being posed in relation to the changing uh, regional dynamics that we are experiencing. Now, many of you, those who been, you know, who are keen observer and, and practitioner and academics in the field of international relations, you would be the first to acknowledge that uh, one of the most difficult feature or difficult uh, quality that international relation uh, theorists and practitioners must deal with and must grapple with is the notion of change. How do you uh, manage change? How do you respond to change? Uh, often case, uh, such a sense of challenge uh, emanate from uh, the sense of uncertainty what change would bring. Uh, and sometimes a change is accompanied by a sense of uh, uh, trepidation, some sense of uh, concern in terms of what is to come. And even in many cases, it tends to accentuate, uh, worsen deeply held fears and concern and misperceptions. And as a result, we have uh, even more complex uh, uh, situation in front of us. In other words, 
dealing with change or managing change or responding to change in international relations, in my view, arguably is one of the most uh, challenging uh, 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 pursuit that one can, can, can undertake. Now, of course, this morning or this afternoon's uh, discussion relates to uh, regional changes, the dynamics of change in Southeast Asia and beyond, and where ASEAN's place is in that uh, dynamics. The first suggestion I would like to make, and, and I will simply illustrate my suggestion with some examples, is I would like to make the contention or the suggestion that in the case of ASEAN, ASEAN actually has been a driver of change. Uh, ASEAN has not in the past, I can only speak of the past principally, uh, ASEAN in the past has been uh, a driver of change. Uh, it has not simply been reactive and, and, and passive, but on the contrary, ASEAN uh, on the whole, recognizing that uh, change is permanent, that change is a permanent state of affairs, that rather than being passive, rather than being simply reactive, ASEAN actually took matters to its own hand and be the driver of that change, be transformative, be a driver of positive change uh, in our region. And I'd like to, to illustrate, if I may, uh, that suggestion with some examples at the, at the risk of, obviously at the risk of oversimplification. Uh, the first uh, example relates to the uh, changes, the dynamic changes that ASEAN brought about in the relations between countries of Southeast Asia uh, 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 themselves. As uh, colleagues and friends would, uh, would be aware that prior to ASEAN 1967, uh, Southeast Asia, like much of the world, the regions of the world at the time, and even now, was a region very much uh, riveted, uh, divided by divisions. Uh, there were inbuilt, inherent disputes uh, between Southeast Asian countries themselves. And it was a, a region that was marked by deep animosity, by suspicion, in some cases, even open conflict, and essentially a situation that I have said, described as being of a trust deficit. Now, Southeast Asian countries uh, could easily have simply followed that reality and accept that reality of division. As in many other instances, for instance, in Northeast Asia, uh, we have the divisions uh, marked by most dramatically on the Korean Peninsula and the different uh, actors or states behind that particular equation. But in the case of Southeast Asia, slowly, step by step, incrementally, uh, the dynamics uh, began to change in Southeast Asia. And the contention I wish to make, the suggestion I wish to make is that these changes did not occur by accident. They were part of a coherent, cohesive, deliberate, sustained, persistent, patient efforts by the leaders of Southeast Asia countries at the time. Some uh, hallmarks or some key moments that demonstrate or that propel the change I, I might, I might uh, uh, illustrate. One is the signing in 1976 of the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, 1976 Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. Essentially, uh, this treaty, as many of you would be aware, uh, commits countries of Southeast Asia uh, to signatories to the treaty to resolve problems and issues between them peacefully, to renounce the use of force. Now, one may think nowadays that this is actually a non-event. Some of you may think, what's the big fuss? But it was a big deal then, uh, 10 years, only 10 years after ASEAN formation. Because as I said before, at the time, uh, Southeast Asia was a region divided perfectly along many, uh, in many ways, and yet, the, the leaders of ASEAN at the time determined that whatever problems that they have, they will place diplomacy at the forefront. And I think 
this kind of uh, non-use of force, or in some contexts, some people will use the term non-aggression uh, treaty, uh, sort of had a decompressing effect. It had the effect of building, instilling a sense of trust that come what may, however difficult the situations are, we will we commit not to reduce force to uh, resolve them. So that was, I thought, a rather transformative, uh, forward-looking uh, uh, attitude that changed the dynamic in Southeast Asia. Similarly, uh, over the years, as you colleagues would know, ASEAN expanded from the original ASEAN 4-5 to become the so-called ASEAN 10 bringing together within under one roof countries uh, of Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. Uh, it wasn't at all a given thing at the time. Uh, as you may be aware, at the time, ASEAN was described as being a so-called pro-West uh, grouping aligned against non-Western leaning countries. But, you know, I mean, Again, it would have been easier probably for, for countries of ASEAN at the time to simply live with that reality. But instead, uh, genuine efforts were made to reach out, to embrace, and to do the hard work to bring the countries of the so-called CLNV to the ASEAN fold under one ASEAN family. Of course, with all the attendant uh, difficulties, because we are, as a result, ASEAN is even more diverse even more uh, uh, varied than it was ever before. But uh, in the view then is that uh, there is unity in diversity, uh, a more diverse ASEAN, yes, certainly more complicated, but at least we have one common tent to discuss the problems uh, amongst us. And not least of all, uh, a transformative uh, moment uh, in the dynamics of Southeast Asia was the introduction of the idea of an ASEAN community uh, in Southeast Asia. Now, this was a project begun in the early 2000s. Uh, many of you would, would be aware that initially, initially it was an ASEAN economic community, only one pillar ASEAN community. But at the behest of countries like Indonesia and others, we came up with the idea of three pillar ASEAN, ASEAN economic community, ASEAN sociocultural community, and ASEAN political and security community. Essentially, again, extremely forward looking because it could have been far, e been far easier if we simply at the time simply stood still and, and take things as a given. But in 2003, when Indonesia was chairing ASEAN, we came to the view that if we remain as an association only in a world of constant change and evolution and greater integration, then ASEAN's relevance will slowly dissipate, will slowly uh, erode. Hence, we need to think about not the world of 2003, but the world of 2020, because at the time, the initial ASEAN community vision was a community to be achieved by 2020. So imagine, the kind of a political somersault, the kind of political vision that, that was required to think beyond what was then, but to, to, to think about what could be. And I remember at the time when we discussed especially the idea of an ASEAN political security community, of ASEAN social cultural community, many, uh, including within ASEAN, uh, you know, belittle the efforts. They say, yes, they can understand an ASEAN economic community, but how about ASEAN political security community? It is said then at, by some detractors that this is not an ASEAN issue. We have ideas such as non-interference uh, and the idea that internal developments are precisely that internal, not for ASEAN to deliberate on. But at the time, uh, countries like Indonesia and eventually all ASEAN countries uh, resolved that debate. We came to the conclusion all the way back in 2003, all the way back to 2003, and there's no need to reinvent and to, to go through the same pain, painful debate. We resolved already at that time that internal developments, internal developments in one another's countries, if they 
can potentially have ramifications to the wider region. And therefore, as one big ASEAN family, it is only normal and it is only natural that we should be engaging one another in this type of issues. Not in an unfriendly way, not in a way that is meant to interfere or, or to, to pontificate or to suffocate, but simply to talk these issues through and then to de demonstrate common solidarity and to get us all out of this situation. I think this is especially pertinent. And I, I, if there is a question later on this, this issue, I will be extremely happy to address it, but extremely pertinent in the current context where there are developments in some of our ASEAN countries. And to my deep regret, to my deep regret that somehow uh, some countries in ASEAN is like reversing the clock as if we have to go back to basics again, we have to ask the question again, is this a uh, contravening in contravention to non-interference, et cetera. When those type of debate have been had, have been resolved, that's why we have the ASEAN political security community. That is why we are supposed to have an ASEAN that is caring and that is sharing as well. So that is one uh, transformative dynamic that I wanted to illustrate how ASEAN did not simply respond or be passive, but we were driver of change, namely in intra-Southeast Asian relations. And I gave some examples, some key moments when this transformation was propelled, was pushed forward. Uh, the other dynamic uh, I would like to mention is the relationship between countries of Southeast Asia and the wider region. And of course, colleagues, at the center at the MGIMO would be extremely well versed and ex extremely informed about how at one time, Southeast Asia was uh, a region perfectly divided, uh, you know, divided not only along East-West, meaning uh, US Western uh, uh, Cold War Alliance with the Soviet Union on the other hand. And then of course you have uh, China's own unique interests, but essentially, uh, Southeast Asia did not only suffer from divisions amongst themselves that are inherently uh, local, but the, those divisions were magnified, were accentuated by the projection of Cold War rivalry. And in essence, uh, in essence at the time, uh, uh, countries of Southeast Asia on the whole were like pawns uh, in major power rivalries with hardly any say uh, in how they should conduct themselves. And in the end, literally, in some cases, uh, the joke in the, the physically, Southeast Asia became like the battleground uh, for major power uh, the, the, uh, competition and, and conflict as well. But once again, uh, over time, decades long, Southeast Asia transformed. And once again, as I said before, in the, as in the intra-Southeast Asian uh, development, the transformation did not occur by accident, uh, far from it. There was a script, there was a purposeful, deliberate, patient undertaking to change where we were and where we wish to be. Of course, it, this can be done uh, overnight. It took years of persistent efforts by countries of Southeast Asia. And let me just simply very quickly illustrate some of those key moments. Uh, colleagues may be aware that initially in the early 70s, ASEAN's uh, orientation, collective orientation was so-called neutrality as represented in the idea of zone of peace, freedom and neutrality, ZOP Fund of 1971. In my view, uh, the neutrality out outlook of ASEAN at the time was a minimalist uh, outlook, an outlook that represents the degree of confidence or lack of confidence at the time ASEAN uh, uh, had of its own capacity, essentially imploring, appealing to the so-called major powers to please leave us alone. In fact, the document, the Zop Fun document, speak of us Southeast Asia being neutralized, neutralized. So there is an element of being actively neutralized for the sake of our own peace and security. So it was a very minimalist, don't bother us, we don't want to choose type of outlook. 
but gradually we began to gather confidence. Uh, subsequent to the idea of neutrality, uh, ASEAN countries begin to speak of the idea of regional resilience. This is actually a projection of Indonesia's own concept of national resilience. Essentially, uh, we need the, we define security in a most holistic way, not simply security in a limited military sense, but security in terms of stability, uh, economic, sociocultural, etc. And if ASEAN, if Southeast Asia is resilient, then it will not offer opportunities for major power uh, interference and projection of their interests in Southeast Asia. Neutrality, resilience, and subsequently, we began to use the term ASEAN centrality. I think this is a word that is often used and often suggested, but I think it is critically important in terms of reflecting ASEAN's ambitions and ASEAN's uh, uh, view of itself. Because in that during this period, ASEAN began to develop their own external, not quite like European Union common external policy, but at least common policies vis-a-vis -vis their so-called dialogue partners. This was the most prolific period when ASEAN developed relationship with countries such as Russia, obviously, uh, and then countries, others like New Zealand, Australia, India, United States, uh, Europe, that all the dialogue partners. And not only did we develop all this network of relationship, but we began to speak of ASEAN centrality, ASEAN in the driving seat role. ASEAN not only having, not only having convening power, able to bring all these countries under one roof in one common processes, but ASEAN actually shaping, molding the architecture. ASEAN actually determining the norms and principles of the behavior of states in not only in Southeast Asia, but beyond Southeast Asia. Now, some of this uh, platform or some of these ASEAN led or ASEAN initiated processes are well known obviously to friends at the center and beyond. I, I simply cite, I have cited most, some of them meaning the dialogue partner relations that we have with a number of key uh, economies, but we also have uh, set up such as the ASEAN Regional Forum, the ASEAN Plus Three is uniquely important, and not least of all, the East Asia Summit uh, that ASEAN introduced in 2005. Now, East Asia Summit at the beginning did not include Russia, or the United States. And I have, to, I have to pay tribute to the fact that even before on the eve of ASEAN East Asia summits uh, setting up or, or convening, Russia was uh, actually quite keen to join then as well. But at the time, I remember as someone who was part of this process, one of the key thought at the time was, how can we ensure that Rus Russia's inevitable accession or, or inclusion in the East Asia summit is one that is um, uh, the cre create positive dynamics and that, that doesn't include, that doesn't uh, in, uh, uh, unintendedly create complications. That's why we ensured and had a, like a deliberate and purposeful attempt to ensure that Russia's joining this the, uh, East Asia summit occurred at the same time as uh, Amer United States uh, admission to the East Asia summit in 2010-2011. So the point that I wanted to, to, to illustrate or to make is that like the intra-Southeast Asian dynamic, ASEAN collectively and purposefully change was the driver of the changes in the geopolitical and, and uh, beyond the region situation. And, and I think it does illustrate well ASEAN's uh, uh, confidence and sense of purpose in being able to shape and mold the region. But those are all the past. And, and let please allow me just in the second part of my uh, this, uh, sharing of thoughts to refer to the present. Uh, because um, you know, it's, it wouldn't suffice uh, to simply talk of the past, but especially not for people like me, but for people who are decision makers who are current active decision makers 
it is their responsibility not simply to uh, dwell on the past, but to recognize what are the current challenges and what are the future challenges uh, as well. And here, I think, uh, without at the risk, I don't wish to simply go through the world headlines and to see these are developments that ASEAN must respond to, because I think all of you would be following day in and day out uh, developments all around the world and how relevant, how important, how of concern they are, et cetera, et cetera. I don't wish to describe them because you already know them. But what I wish is to try to simplify at the risk of, well, suggest at the risk of oversimplification is that ASEAN, in my view, has a twin problem or twin challenge slash opportunities because it could be it could be problem or it could be opportunity it really depends uh, on how ASEAN uh, choose to uh, to deal with them they can be passive and wait until a small problem become uh, a huge problem or they can try to be a little bit smarter by preempting the problem and shaping and molding as they have done in the previous five decades there are two dynamics uh, two tendencies that I think ASEAN must provide, continue to provide a response to. One is ASEAN's response to the extremely complex and constantly changing uh, geopolitical dynamics. In other words, ASEAN and the wider region. I did say before, this is not something that ASEAN is uh, unfamiliar with because ASEAN's existence all throughout have been an existence marked by a competing major power interests uh, beyond and in Southeast Asia. So it is not new for ASEAN to be pulled left and right uh, from by different forces, different countries outside the region. And as I said before, they, ASEAN actually came up with the script to deal with them, neutrality, resilience, centrality and then centrality there are different aspects of centrality uh, that we try to navigate and try to develop i am not so sure now however whether asean has shown the requisite um, has demonstrated the requisite capacity to deal with the current challenge uh, i hope i'm wrong uh, because Actually, when, as we speak, all the wherewithal, all the means are there in terms of institutions, in terms of processes. I mentioned before, we have the ASEAN Plus process, ASEAN Plus Three, the East Asia Summit, ASEAN Regional Forum, and even I didn't mention RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So the modalities for ASEAN to be the conductor, to be the driver, to be the uh, in a central position is there, is there for the taking, is there to be utilized. But I am beginning to be a little bit concerned by the apparent uh, suggestion as if we are now essentially uh, reducing ourselves to become a convener of diplomatic processes rather than actually shaping and molding. I hear often uh, in ASEAN capitals, uh, expressions of concern, expression of worry about, for instance, US-China rivalry, uh, expression of exasperation, an appeal to be left alone that we don't want to choose, but emotion, Emotion is not policy. It is not good enough for ASEAN to simply lament and uh, feel, feel sorry for the situation. ASEAN must exercise and must utilize the strategic autonomy, the centrality that it owns, that it earned for a specific purpose. Otherwise, the centrality will become merely a convening centrality. For instance, in the face, for instance, in the face of major power rivalries uh, in our region, which is not a new phenomenon, and, and, and obviously most people will tend to think this, is, this must be US-China, 
most people will think of that way, but actually it's not only US-China. For instance, relations between, say, between China and India, uh, the border situation has not been uh, that uh, uh, conducive recently. And I know that Russia played an especially positive role in, in bringing uh, the situation under, uh, I mean, the, the, the dynamics to be managed. But in the face of all this uh, situation, how, besides saying that we are concerned, what should ASEAN be offering and suggesting? This is where I feel that there is a little bit of a policy gap. There is a little bit of uh, lacune in ASEAN's thinking at the moment. I really salute and appreciate and, and, and think it's incredibly important that ASEAN came up with the Indo-Pacific outlook. And in the outlook, they speak of ASEAN being honest broker, honest broker. That was the term that I thought I read in the Indo-Pacific outlook to major power uh, situations. But outlook doesn't implement by itself. It has to be implemented. It has to be delivered. It has to be given meaning. For instance, in the face of the reality of major power rivalries and competition, isn't it in ASEAN's interest, given this is a fact of life, that this is a reality that can be wished away because we have to be realist on, on the one hand, this is a fact of life that can't be simply uh, wished away, but surely in the face of this reality, we must way, find ways of means, ways and means to um, stabilize, to promote strategic stability, to promote what the term I used in the past was an equilibrium between the major powers so that there is no miscalculation there is no misreading of intent, a small crisis, a small incident quickly developing to become a major crisis. Surely there is a moment when ASEAN can tell, can suggest to the non-ASEAN countries that perhaps they too can benefit from a treaty of amity and cooperation like commitment. Perhaps to have countries like China, the United States, China and Russia, China and India, Japan and Russia, Japan and Korea, to say, yes, we have problems amongst us, but at the same time, like ASEAN, we commit ourselves to solve these problems peacefully. Surely, there is something that, is, uh, that ASEAN can offer. And ASEAN did offer in 12, 2013. I remember that very much. And I remember our friends in Russia, in Moscow, was not... Uh, inimical was not in opposition to the idea. Russia at the time gave space for the idea to be further developed. This idea of having a common commitment, actually we already have a so-called Bali principles of the East Asia summit signed in 2011 among the East Asian summit countries, precisely in principle commit committing to this idea. But there is one flesh one concrete suggestion that ASEAN can make be, if they were to, to proceed beyond expressing concern. Or for instance, wouldn't it make sense for ASEAN to suggest the idea of having a crisis management capacity for our region? Our region is replete with potential conflict situations. Uh, I don't have to mention them, but you, 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 all of you know uh, the various conflict flashpoints. Uh, but our region, despite the uh, proliferation of processes, we really don't have a more timely action-oriented crisis management capacity. Surely there must be room for all the uh, ambassadors, for instance, in Jakarta from the East Asia summit countries that are already in Jakarta, represented to ASEAN. Surely they can convene themselves as a peace and security council of the East Asia summit that can meet real time very quickly if there was to be a crisis brewing so that miscalculation can be avoided, 
this reading of intention can be uh, avoided. But I am just mentioning those ideas by way of trying to trigger ASEAN countries to go beyond exasperation, to go beyond saying that they are concerned, to go beyond issuing a vision, an outlook, by way of example to colleagues in ASEAN who are listening. Tomorrow I'm informed, uh, I'm, I read in, 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 in the media that the so-called Quad countries will meet at the summit level for the first time. This is for the first time, if I'm not mistaken. Now the Quad as a process, if I'm not mistaken, was introduced in 2012. 2012 or 2011, in the early 2010s. But ASEAN, ASEAN, by playing up, by making the point that the, the only game in town, the main game in town is the East Asia Summit and the ASEAN Regional Forum, because it brings everyone under one roof. We manage to put a lid on that process. The quad that came to being at the time remained essentially a highly technical level process. But if we allow ASEAN, allow its own institutions, such as the East Asia Summit, the ASEAN Regional Forum to become essentially increasingly ceremonial in nature, unable to deal with real 24 seven problems, then countries will begin to look elsewhere to find, to meet their security needs, to address their security concern. Hence, we have the Quad, no doubt, this will invoke a reaction from other countries that deem the Quad to be addressed against them. And then there will be a reaction and potential different processes and once again, potentially, South Asia, uh, East Asia or Indo-Pacific, Asia Pacific, Southeast Asia could once again, like during the Cold War, be divided up along this type of interests. The point that I wanted to make is that if ASEAN becomes passive, if ASEAN doesn't invest in its own processes, empower these processes, make themselves relevant, then I can guarantee you that ASEAN will wither. Increasingly, countries will find it polite probably to attend some of the ASEAN meetings, but the real regional problems of trust deficit, of conflict resolution will be resolved elsewhere. So that is one um, dynamic that I would like to suggest that ASEAN must find a res not only a, res a response to, but to shape and mold as they have in the past. You know, ASEAN has always been, the ASEAN member states have always had different foreign policy orientations. You have countries that are closer to the so-called West, countries that are closer probably to, at the time, one time to the Soviet Union, to China, to others, or like Indonesia, more known aligned. But in the past, I can only say, emphasize that point. In the past, the diversity of, Indonesia, of ASEAN's foreign policy outlook, the, the members of ASEAN became its strength. It wasn't a source of weakness, it was a source of strength because we are able to be friends to all kinds of countries of different stripes and inclinations. In ASEAN, you find sufficient diversity of countries that can accommodate all. But how is it then today in 2021, that same reality becomes or is seen to be a reason for ASEAN not to be able to act with one voice? It is a challenge for current policymakers and I'm sure with the requisite wisdom and requisite determination, uh, it can be addressed. My final point is on the second 
dynamic that we must try to address. This is the so-called internal, external. I already made reference to it earlier when I speak of the ASEAN political security community pillar. Ours is an ASEAN that is different to what it was in 1967. Ours is an ASEAN that is different to 2003, 2005. It is an ASEAN of 2021, a community. So it means uh, our outlook and our practices and our vision must reflect that reality. And therefore, as I said before, when we have internal problems, challenges amongst us, there must be an ASEAN script and ASEAN engagement friendly, familial, but necessary as well. And if, if colleagues who are students of history, and I'm not, uh, to be honest, as well versed as many of you, if you think about it, most of the problems or challenges in Southeast Asia in, res in recent decades have not been interstate in nature. They have been essentially or initially internal in nature, as at the beginning internal, becomes imploding and becomes regional and even in some cases global. Therefore, ASEAN must preempt, must recognize this reality and find a common ASEAN solution to this type of extremely complex solution. ASEAN cannot address 21st century problems with 20th century prism, 20th century paradigm and perspective. It is possible and it is, it says so. It is, this is not the views from some Western capital or other capitals that whoever it may be. It is ASEAN's own freely expressed treaty binding commitment to respect principles such as good governance, democratic principles, human rights. They are not some ideas and principles being imposed elsewhere. They are ASEAN's own principles. And therefore, we can subscribe, implement, and respect these principles at the same time as we always will and as we always must respect the idea of non-interference in our internal affairs. Those are some of the thoughts that I wanted to share. I did speak far longer than I should, and I do apologize profusely, Dr. Koldunova. I did promise I was speaking, I, I wasn't going to speak too long, but uh, I get, uh, uh, yeah, I, I didn't, uh, I wasn't disciplined enough, but uh, I'm looking forward hopefully to some uh, discussions, hopefully if the time allows uh, and, and look forward to it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bapak Martin. Um, well, I have uh, a feeling that uh, several of the questions which our audience raised from a, f a further registration forum were very um, appropriately ad ad addressed by you. Uh, so uh, I do apologize to our audience that we will probably not be able to address all the questions, but uh, I'll try my best to group them in clusters so we cover the majority of the topics. And sorry that this time uh, I will not provide the floor for raising your blue or yellow hands and ask uh, them by voice, because uh, just for the sake of dealing with as many questions as we can. So I think that uh, Buck Mario covered the issue of scope of ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific, just probably if you could briefly um, comment what countries uh, are there. Uh, I mean, I think that probably the meaning is geographical. That's That was the question from Unita uh, Permatasari from Indonesia. And uh, more importantly, I think that the question is how um, would you assess the perspectives of ASEAN's interaction with Quad? Is there any link institutional or not institutional that's the question from uh, miss olga dobrinska from the diplomatic academy of russia because as we all know uh, the only country which is officially involved in quad activities is currently only vietnam and from a different angle if i could pack in here uh, several questions akram Irman, mr akram Irman from indonesia um, 
asks about the uh, prospects of economic integration in ASEAN. E and if uh, and he uh, asks if you see the RCEP dynamics and great involvement with the PRC, the Republic of Korea and Japan, um, a sign of more broader approach of ASEAN at the expense of strengthening cooperation with fellow ASEAN countries. If you could possibly address this free from sim simpler geographical things than to more structural security and economic things, well, that would be great. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed uh, for those questions. It does, the question does reflect the, uh, uh, the questioners, uh, not only interest, but also their, their, their profound uh, uh, knowledge of the issues at hand. Uh, on the first uh, question on the Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, this uh, notion of the, geographic, uh, the, the ge geographical scope of, of the so-called Indo-Pacific. This is a commonly raised issue. Uh, I think uh, many of us would recognize that, you know, whenever you have uh, an organization, uh, whatever you call this organization, invariably one of the first question asked is, who are the members? Who are in, in who are out? Uh, the, where, are, where are the margins? And I think uh, on the Indo-Pacific, aside from when you speak of the geography, aside from the reality that we are basically speaking of the region, geographic region, encompassing or being brought together by the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, that's the obvious uh, notion. I think we shouldn't be uh, to, uh, to, perfection can be the enemy of the good. I mean, we shouldn't try to be too uh, fine-tuned uh, at the beginning to see who is in and who is out. Uh, because we should let the process uh, take time and develop the habit of cooperation. And, and, and just to, uh, to give a, by way of example to our colleague who had asked a question, uh, Dr. Koldunova, is uh, I mean, when we all developed the ASEAN Regional Forum, for instance, uh, there was always a school of thought uh, who are in the ASEAN Regional Forum. Uh, should it be uh, only countries of uh, East Asia, uh, or, or, or what, or, or, or the Pacific. But at the time, I, I certainly, when I was promoting the idea and, and, and engage in the process, my vision was always Indo-Pacific. Uh, that's why, you know, I mean, we, we welcome very much the participation of, participation of countries like uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh uh, in the process, because we felt uh, this is a way of actually uh, of uh, ensuring that the ASEAN Regional Forum, although it's called ASEAN Regional Forum, uh, is actually uh, already from the beginning Indo-Pacific. Uh, likewise, when we developed the East Asia Summit, our, our colleague may be aware that at the beginning, the idea of an East Asia community or even East Asia Summit for some was supposed to be limited only to ASEAN plus three, uh, ASEAN and then China, Korea and Japan. It was Indonesia and followed by Australia that was persistent uh, in saying that it must from the beginning include India, it must from the beginning include Australia and New Zealand so that there is already a ready-made Indo-Pacific elements. Uh, of course, over time, things may evolve and develop, but it is not only about geography, it is about geopolitics. And I think, um, you know, I mean, when you, when you, when you, when your motivation or your guidance is the geopolitical dynamics, then you just follow it where it takes you, right? I mean, you don't have to be too uh, restrictive. If the issue demand cooperation with country A and B and C, that is happens to be outside into a certain expectation, uh, so be it, that is the reality. And this, I think it, uh, um, uh, ties in to the third question. If I may jump the second question, I need to be reminded uh, what the second question was, but the third question was to do with RCEP, economic integration. Uh, I wanted to mention, uh, because I didn't go into RCEP uh, earlier, RCEP, the Re Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership was Indonesia's idea, not China, uh, Indonesia's idea in 2011 when Indonesia chaired ASEAN. And the idea, again, uh, illustrative of a, a transformative mindset, forward-thinking, forward-looking mindset. The idea 
was to connect the outer dots because ASEAN already have free trade agreements with all the element dialogue partners involved and we are connecting the outer dots. Again, providing ASEAN as the common home to all these efforts. Hence, for the first time, you have China, Korea and Japan belonging to one common uh, free trade zone, which, is, which didn't exist before. Uh, it took ASEAN to bring these countries under one roof. Unfortunately, and this is uh, my, 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 my uh, sense of uh, disappointment, but I, I, I get it, the problem is not easy. Unfortunately, India did not join <laughs> because uh, that is a major, a major, major missing uh, piece uh, element uh, because uh, India obviously is not in APEC. Uh, that is why we wish very much from the beginning, again, to reflect the Indo-Pacific outlook uh, that India must be within RCEP, but it is what it is. I hope ASEAN doesn't give up on India too easily. But most of all, and this is where I turn to our colleague, uh, our friends in Russia and the United States. I know that in the, in the United States, they are probably even under current Biden administration, the idea of rejoining the TPP uh, is out of the question domestically, politically, and there is talk of having like a sectoral uh, arrangements or sectoral agreements on different segments. But I think ASEAN must work extremely hard, extremely hard in the way that we did the same in 2010, 2011, to make sure that when, if and when they do engage the United States and Russia, the preferred platform is RCEP, not TPP, <laughs> because TPP doesn't include all of ASEAN countries. Indonesia, as at least as I left it, uh, uh, you know, we didn't have any, any inclination to TPP because it wasn't ASEAN driven. That is why we, we weren't serious and, and inclined towards it. But I think it would be a, a shame if at this critical juncture, ASEAN, in the same way we allowed the Quad to revive, uh, uh, if we allow uh, countries like the United States, Russia, uh, to turn elsewhere. I know in the Russia's case, of course, there is one glaring, uh, if I'm not mistaken, glaring uh, omission or, or vacuum in terms of a free trade area between ASEAN and Russia, which is uh, one of the precursor to it. But I know there's been some talk about uh, ASEAN and the um, uh, Eurasian, is it Eurasian uh, Cooperation? Eurasian Economic Union. Yes, yes. I think there's some idea of having an ASEAN Eurasian cooper economic cooperation type of agreement. That's not impossible as well, uh, but it is important uh, for Russia to be part of the geoeconomic equation and not to be absent or not to absent itself from this process. Uh, Dr. Koldunov, I, I missed the second question, to be honest. You, uh, partly, uh, you partly covered it, and the question okay. was about the perspectives of ASEAN's interaction with Quad. Uh, oh, yes. So yes, 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 I yes. think that yeah, uh, yeah. you reacted yeah. to, to yeah. this question but perfectly But I wanted well. to be sure, I wanted to be not to be misunderstood. ASEAN never pretend that it must be the only game in town. I mean, ASEAN can live with, can prosper with, other processes. That's why you have the ASEAN itself, the ASEAN-led processes, you have ASEAN Regional Forum, you have APEC, you have ASEM, you have uh, other processes in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the region. And, and it is like, an, uh, like a, a complex, mutually reinforcing uh, process. But the point that I wanted to make is that spe specifically on the Quad, if the Quad is allowed to become, whether it is, whether it is in reality or not, it doesn't matter. If, if, the perception, if the perception is allowed to build that somehow the Quad is like an alignment of countries against another country, it could be the beginning of uh, the dissection of the region once again. And I think ASEAN must come up with a, with a common ten. Otherwise, you'll have one ASEAN common ten, 
uh, which is there, people politely attend, but actually they meet elsewhere and make the difficult decisions elsewhere. But it's not a zero sum game. Uh, I mean, we should, we, should, uh, we should respect the process and it is an important process and, and uh, that it shouldn't be seen as being fundamentally at odds with ASEAN's uh, objectives. Because as I'm sure, all the ASEAN, uh, all the quad countries continue to invest in ASEAN. But it's just that I'm saying, we shouldn't be complacent. What it reminds, it reminds that there are some needs out there that are not being met by ASEAN. Hence, there is all these other processes. That is, it. that's all. Thank you. Since you mentioned Russia, uh, not once, let me turn to the cluster of questions which concerned mm -hmm. ASEAN and Russia relations. Some of them, uh, I believe, should be addressed to our decision makers since they ask about the reasons of Russia to change its focus on foreign policy from West to East, especially ASEAN, and how is Russia's deep integration policy to and beyond Central Asia towards Asia as a continent. So uh, I just uh, named these questions, uh, I, and I'm not very much sure that th these are questions to you uh, specifically, but uh, there are other questions as well, which ask mm -hmm. about ASEAN, what ASEAN can do uh, and uh, which steps it should take in order to build better ties with Russia. And th this is a question from um, uh, from the Philippines, from France, Edward Isaac Martinez. And what can be the relationship between ASEAN and Russia in the pandemi pandemic era? And surprisingly, the question about other prospects besides Russian agriculture for ASEAN. So I take this question as an evidence that uh, everything is fine with Russian ASEAN agricultural cooperation already. <laughs> Well, uh, thanks for that, of course. And finally, uh, the Russia's Greater Eurasian Partnership concept. Is there any reaction uh, from ASEAN, uh, any um, considerations how ASEAN can, uh, can be, well, uh, a part or a partner? Uh, that's my addition to Jonathan Jordan's uh, question. So which steps ASEAN should take in order to build better ties with Russia? What are the prospects? Uh, what is the influence of the pandemic? What can we do? And broader picture, greater Eurasian partnership, can we fit in uh, Russia's uh, integration perspectives, ASEAN integration perspectives? Thank you. Well, um, Russia and ASEAN's uh, relations is a strategic uh, partnership, right? I mean, that's how I understand uh, the relationship to be. Uh, it is not simply a relationship between uh, dialogue partners, but it is uh, a strategic partnership. And, and I think by strategic, uh, it suggests the importance of the relationship uh, extend beyond you know, limited bilateral relationship. It is a relationship that may have consequence, that may have relevance and impact uh, globally as well. Uh, and I think this is the ambition or the, the benchmark that our leaders, uh, our decision makers have set for ourselves. Uh, it, it is not a, a simply a regular, a normal run of the mill dialogue partnership. It is a strategic partnership. And thankfully, uh, because of the wisdom of, uh, of, of colleagues uh, uh, and including the, an, an eminent person group that I, I, I recall once being set up for this purpose, there is already a very comprehensive uh, many of uh, uh, plan of action uh, to be followed by the two sides, right? I mean, cooperation essentially in the three pillar of ASEAN community, uh, the political security, economic, sociocultural, and uh, the two sides would do well to simply uh, actually implement those uh, action plan and, and, and visions because uh, uh, we are not we are not uh, short of uh, intentions and plans. It's all there, but it needs to be consistently uh, pursued. But one thing that I feel that, uh, you know, aside from the things that are already agreed uh, in the, and formalized, like any relationship, even among states, the people-to-people -people angle is extremely uh, important. Uh, extremely important. I mean. Uh, more ASEAN folks needs to know more about Russia, 
and uh, more Russians need to more know about the individual ASEAN member states, its peoples. And I think whatever one can do to, to fill in the gaps or provide the, the elements for action to promote greater interaction and greater, greater uh, 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 sense of, of understanding between the two sides would do well in actually strengthening the two sides relationship. Uh, one thing that I wanted to emphasize as well, uh, um, Dr. Koldunova, is that in all my interactions with our Russian, my then Russian colleagues, especially especially when I was working at the, when I was representative at the United Nations, Indonesia's representative at the UN, uh, including when in, when Indonesia was in UN, at the UN Security Council. One trait that I find uh, in Russia's foreign policy outlook that mirrors Indonesia is the importance you attach to regional cooperation. Whenever there are conflict situation, conflict difficulties anywhere, uh, Russia tends to be ready to give the regional setup, for instance, ASEAN, the primary responsibility, the primary leadership role to address the issue. Because after all, in the final analysis, it is the countries of the region that knows the region best rather than someone you know, sitting thousands of miles away. So I think that quality, Russia's quality of recognizing the importance of regional approach, uh, regional solution is one way that's well worth under, underscoring. The Eurasian, uh, Greater Eurasian, uh, uh, what do you call it, initiative, obviously, it, I mean, I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not well, well versed uh, in, in the most latest development, but to me, it does, it does run similar to the idea of the Indo-Pacific that Indonesia has been uh, pushing for. You know, Indonesia is an archipelagic country straddling two oceans, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And therefore we have an interest to make sure that the Pacific Ocean related dynamic and the Indian Ocean related dynamic are synergic in a peaceful way. And I guess Russia being the country that it is, uh, straddling Europe and Asia, uh, you have a, a, a real interest in making sure uh, that, real, ge that geographic reality becomes a, a, a source for stability and prosperity rather than for instability. It would be wonderful I think, and exciting, to be honest, to, to, to think of projects involving the Eurasian, Eurasian uh, uh, countries and the Indo-Pacific countries, because then you have like a, almost like a contiguous uh, uh, zone of, of cooperation and, and partnership. Uh, after all, geography still matters. In, even in the 21st century, uh, geography matters. Thank you. Well, Pakmart, interestingly that you see uh, this area in such a positive way because we have a colleague in St. Petersburg who constantly works in the opposite direction. He continues to stress the greater Eurasian arc of instability and alarming right. us that there are problems here and there and we must be vigilant. But of course, uh, I do appreciate your positive view. That, that's actually what we all would love to see because it helps people to communicate, business to flourish yeah. and we had a comment in the chat i think that uh, those who are uh, online can see that comment from uh, steve hansen harrison sorry that russia must deepen cooperation uh, with ASEAN in uh, sectors like tourism, creative industries, digital economy, education, etc. Et All this is impossible if we just have uh, the arc of instability instead of uh, area of prosperity. But and, we and, all and need the, to the, work on that. Yeah. And the point as well, uh, Dr. Kolunova, I think a country like Indonesia and, us, and Russia and ASEAN as a whole, you know, we can develop multifaceted uh, diplomacy. It, it doesn't mean it doesn't have to mean uh, when you look to one side it means you are looking less to another side. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you know, the diplomacy, foreign policy can be multi-pronged and multi-oriented. It can be mutually reinforcing. It doesn't mean it doesn't have to be zero sum. And as I was uh, talking to you before, Dr. Kolunova, before we began, I am I'm constantly reminded of how complex is uh, Russia's uh, border 
and varied how Russia's uh, border uh, uh, situations are and, and must be quite, quite challenging, yeah. What is left is to, you know, to put our hands and to, to make it uh, happen. Um, since yes. we are running off time a little bit, uh, let me pass to a group of questions which refer to the most burning issue for ASEAN uh, right now. And this is obviously the case of Myanmar. We have six or seven uh, or even now more questions uh, dealing with uh, the Myanmar issue, uh, raising the problems, how should ASEAN and member countries respond? Is there any common uh, policy of ASEAN uh, in terms of uh, dealing with Myanmar? Uh, what can ASEAN really do to resolve the problem? And what are the relations between ASEAN and the present government? My colleagues in Gimur who are teaching um, courses on Southeast Asia and Myanmar uh, are uh, wondering and uh, what should Indonesia or ASEAN do in dealing with problems in Myanmar at this time. Um, so uh, could you please react to this if, if you uh, yeah. have any ideas what can be the situation well, in this regard? Uh, well, th th thank you very much uh, indeed uh, for that question from our colleagues uh, on, on the developments in, in Myanmar. Uh, obviously, there are many ways of dissecting or, or approaching what is in, inevitably a very complex uh, development, right? I mean, one can look at it from the, at the national level, the national level dynamic uh, that is now taking place in Myanmar. They're extremely deplorable, extremely deeply disturbing developments where essentially, essentially, peaceful protesters are being shot at, which I think must be strongly condemned without any reservation. One can look at it at the national level developments. One can express some thoughts on the regional level developments, ASEAN, and as well, the global level. So there are the three level that one can uh, approach what, what, what is now happening, occurring in Myanmar. And, and I don't want to belittle and oversimplify uh, given the time limitation, you know, the nature of the problem and challenge that we are facing. But let me just uh, address this issue by way of some key questions uh, if, of my own, if I may. Uh, one, and I find it extremely unfortunate and, and uh, regret, regrettable that we should be, I should be even asking this question, uh, the basic question, should ASEAN engage on the issue? Because, because unfortunately, as I was saying before, uh, notwithstanding the, the important progress and, and that ASEAN has made in this area of ASEAN political security community, ASEAN community, et cetera, even then ASEAN charter at the beginning or even now, there are still some within ASEAN that actually question that whether ASEAN should engage, making the false assumption or false suggestion as if uh, it is inimical to ASEAN's principle of non-interference. Nothing can be further, farther from the truth. The reality is for decades, for years, ever since the early 2000s and uh, late 90s, 1990s, early 2000s especially, ASEAN has engaged in, with Myanmar, has been part of the equation in Myanmar's democratization process. We have been prodding, we have been encouraging, we have been instilling and, 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 and pushing the, Myanmar, the then Myanmar authorities to press on with their democratization uh, roadmap. Our shortcoming in my view, and I, I'm, I do apologize if I'm a little bit um, harsh, if I appear to be harsh. Perhaps in the last few years, perhaps I, rem I, I, I am to be corrected. Perhaps ASEAN has sort of allowed themselves to disengage in such concern mutual support for democratization efforts. Because individual ASEAN member states, my impression, they tend to become, recent years have become more self-consumed. 
about their own internal developments, about material, economic issues. Issues such as democratization, etc., maybe was not uppermost in their mind. But as all of us know, including especially Indonesia, democratization is a process that there will be ups and downs where we require perseverance, patience, and persistence. And as a result, we are where we are. And to put it simply, it is self-evident that ASEAN must engage. It doesn't have any other alternative. It doesn't, it really doesn't. Because we are seeing now day in, day out, the supposed internal development in Myanmar is beginning to find regional ramifications. It impact on ASEAN, it impact on the region. I've, we hear news reports of some uh, displaced persons crossing over to some neighboring countries. So for ASEAN, the choice is either coming in early, earlier and be part of the solution or, pun, uh, or procrastinate and allow the situation to become worse. So I hope, I hope that ASEAN member states will put aside any reservations or questioning whether this is an issue that deserves their engagement because it has been proven in the past that we have been able to engage and it is part of ASEAN's responsibility. It is a litmus test for ASEAN. So that must be put to rest. And, but I have to say it because in recent months, in recent weeks, I've been, I've been coming across statements from ASEAN member states as if we are back to the 1980s, as if we are back to the 1970s ASEAN, not ASEAN community, as if this is a sort of thing that should, we should pretend that it, it hasn't occurred, as if we should close our eyes and ears and pretend that it is not ASEAN's concern, that we can't even comment on it. Our commentary on Myanmar is not unfriendly. We are trying to, to be together in addressing this problem. But beyond the question of does it engage, which I think is quite in the affirmative, there is a little bit more delicate question of who does it engages? Who does it engage? Because nowadays, uh, there is, we have to be mindful of the fact Unlike in other potential situations, in the case of Myanmar, we have had, Myanmar has had a democratic elections. They have democratically chosen leaders. And these leaders, the will of the people have not been allowed to be manifested. So in any communication that ASEAN must engage or must extend to the junta in Myanmar must be accompanied by a similar engagement, not only similar, but priority engagement with the democratic leaders of Myanmar. The democratic leaders of, uh, democratically elected leaders of Myanmar must be released. They must be released. <laughs> they must be released because they are part of the solution. And when I came across ASEAN's chairman's statement at, at the end of ASEAN Foreign Ministers meeting a uh, uh, few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, it, it saddens me that references to the release of leaders without mentioning Dao Aung San Suu Kyi was expressed as if these are the, the views of some ASEAN member states. In other words, ASEAN allowed themselves to become dissected uh, in that way. Who does it engage? They must engage not only the junta, but also the democratically elected leaders. But the third point is the one that I can't, I can't pretend to know how to proceed, which is what, what do we expect? What ASEAN expect from the engagement? I think this is where I think it's only the decision makers, the current governments in ASEAN that must clarify their ideas and thoughts. I, I hope I'm wrong and I, I truly hope I'm wrong. I, I'm, I'm hoping, hope against hope that in the weeks, in the days since the ASEAN foreign ministers meeting a few days 
few day, uh, last week or so, there's been some informal uh, diplomatic efforts. But otherwise, the foreign ministers meeting that occurred a few days ago, instead of becoming the beginning, the beginning of renewed, sustained ASEAN efforts, it becomes like a, a mini, mini plateau. And then as long as we've had that meeting and manage expectations have been managed, and then now slowly things becomes out of, out of ASEAN's uh, radar screen once more. I hope that is, I'm not right, but I am actually hopeful and I'm actually rather confident that actually as we speak, there are hopefully uh, some informal processes going on uh, between ASEAN member states and the, uh, all the elements in Myanmar to get the restoration, restoration of the democratic path. Not some sham election run by the junta. That is definitely not in my view a solution. Uh, those are some of the thoughts that I wanted to express. Uh, I mean, these are extremely difficult uh, times and Myanmar, the people of Myanmar, the authorities of Myanmar have gone through all kinds of challenges in the past and uh, we have confidence in their resilience uh, in, in addressing the problem. But hopefully the violence, well, not only hopefully, the violence must come to an end. Thank you. Thank you, Bapak Marty, for your, uh, well, frank sharing of your ideas about this Anita situation. We have lots of questions uh, left unanswered about China and COVID situation, but let me use the final 10 minutes to address the uh, questions which I think logically come out of our discussion of the situation in Myanmar. And they refer to the issues which relate to the civil society in the ASEAN countries. What What is their role currently vis-a-vis -vis the previous uh, per historical period, human security issues, um, uh, sustainable development goals which refer to peace and justice for its uh, member states. And finally, a colleague from uh, Russia's uh, People's Friendship University of Russia raised uh, an overarching question which highlights the importance of all these questions. Um, is it not time for ASEAN to address the issue of its own uh, approach uh, towards uh, the problems of democracy, democratization, human rights, etc., and to think about its, uh, its concept of these issues, for, uh, on the one hand, against the background of external influences, we all know well that uh, the United States, the European Union, they have very strong and uh, advanced position on uh, on these issues, and they are not uh, shame of you know going uh, further with their pers perspective. And on the other hand, there are certain uh, developments which are taking place in the region, uh, which probably bring these questions as more urgent for the region itself. If you could address uh, briefly this set of questions, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will take up this, the second question first, if I may, uh, since uh, they are a little bit like a subset of the bigger question. The first question was a, a wider question, but the second question, uh, essentially ASEAN own uh, response probably on, on issues such as democratization, human rights, governance issues. Uh, that is precisely, precisely the objective and the thought behind the idea of having the ASEAN political security community. Essentially, it's not only about ASEAN uh, emphasizing their own commitment to the promotion and protection of human rights, democratic principles and good governance, but also accompanying that. ASEAN's determination to develop their own capacities in this area. Uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, there is an entity within ASEAN that's called, I'm often wrong in this one, I tend to be corrected and I apologize in advance. It's something, it's called ASEAN ICHER, ASEAN, ASEAN Human Rights, uh, Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, ICHER. Uh, this is a, a region-based, region-owned, ASEAN-owned uh, institution within that is uh, that ASEAN adopted to promote, promote and protect uh, 
uh, human rights in, in the area, in the region. So that we don't need to rely on extra regional um, suggestions on how we should conduct ourselves in this domain. Uh, because we pursue this, these objectives because it matters to us. And therefore, because it matters to us, we have to develop our own capacity. And here, the, the institution exists, but once again, as is often the case in the case of ASEAN, it is far easier to come to an agreement to set up something, far more difficult to actually make use of the institution once it's established. Uh, this is where state practice becomes important because agreements doesn't implement by itself. It needs to be empowered. It needs to be implemented and made relevant. This is where leadership matters. Uh, and this is where Indonesia in the past, I can't speak of today because I have no idea. I'm not privy to, to all the details, but in the past, uh, having introduced all these instruments, the ASEAN uh, ICHER, ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, and then we have also another one, the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. We have IPER, ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation. Having created those capacities or potentials, we purposefully and deliberately uh, push them to, to empower themselves. Indonesia, without anyone demanding, without anyone insisting, no one insisted from ASEAN, we voluntarily, we voluntarily asked the ICHER, ASEAN Human Rights uh, Institute, I mean, uh, Intergovernmental Commission of Human Rights, to UPR Indonesia. UPR is the modality like in Geneva, Human Rights Commission, Universal Periodic Review. So ASEAN Human Rights Council uh, Commission, why don't you vet us? Look at our human rights situation. Where are we good at? Where are we bad at? We, we won't take offense. We don't have to do it. It's not in the terms of reference of ASEAN, uh, but we do it anyway because we want to create dynamic positive change, to change habit. Whenever we have in ASEAN informal meetings without anyone asking, I freely, freely inform them of developments in Indonesia, the problems that we have, because I have confidence that these are internal problems and I'm sharing with you voluntarily so that they understand where Indonesia stands. And most of all, there is a positive effect. They begin to offer their own internal problems. In other words, yes, we need, we, we, there is a need to develop our own capacities and capacities exist on paper as we speak. But the challenge now, I think, uh, they often are in abeyance. In abeyance meaning they are not being actively empowered. And this is where countries like Indonesia and others uh, in ASEAN who are professed to be democratic, they must count, I mean, come forward, utilize them, empower them. Otherwise, they, know, they will become uh, passive. Uh, uh, turning to the first question on the role of civil society, uh, one term that I had not used uh, throughout this afternoon, uh, this morning, is the term uh, people-centered ASEAN, uh, or is it people-centered or people-centered, uh, people I think. Uh, now I'm not sure. The, the terminology keeps on changing in ASEAN. Oriented. Uh, People oriented, yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much, yeah, very kind. Because someone said people centered and another said people oriented. Apparently, it, it makes a difference uh, what, how you describe it. But in any case, thankfully, in ASEAN itself, there is a strong recognition among the ASEAN decision makers that for a community to be relevant and to be sustainable, it must be people centered. That's why in the ASEAN, uh, community ideas, especially the ASEAN uh, economic community and ASEAN social cultural community. Uh, there are strong elements to do with civil society empowerment and, and relevance. But again, uh, you know, you can have action uh, vision, you can have plan of action. They only matter if they're actually uh, implemented and made relevant. Uh, you know, I mean, in the past, again, I can only speak of the past, Indonesia deliberately and purposefully 
convene and empower the ASEAN civil society. Uh, you know, whenever there is a summit to be convened in Indonesia or for a minister's meeting or ministerial meeting, we, uh, we, uh, uh, we ensure, we, we, stri we strive to ensure that the civil society, there is interaction, there is interface between decision makers and the civil society so that they can uh, not only be heard, but they can also submit their ideas and thoughts. But uh, what I find a little bit challenging at the moment is that sometimes when I now uh, converse with some civil society colleagues uh, on the one in ASEAN, on the one hand, there is a sense of exasperation that they, they, they are not being given full recognition. But at the same time, they tend, there, there is sometimes the risk of uh, waiting for enabling intergovernmental process. Uh, this is where I think, uh, you know, I mean, an embrace can be suffocating. Uh, in the case of civil society cooperation, sometimes less can be more. Uh, the government, government's decision makers facilitate, make possible, but they shouldn't overwhelm. And I think the civil society in ASEAN, uh, you know, must be a little bit even more, uh, they're already doing it, but be even more proactive, even more uh, uh, searching and, and waging uh, that space. Otherwise, it will be simply too much official led uh, process. But I mean, um, in terms of the wider issues that uh, social economic development issues, what I find most encouraging is that ASEAN has aligned itself with the various SDG goals uh, that set at the UN level. Uh, we have not try to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we simply ensure the ASEAN vision, whatever it was, 2025, uh, sort of align uh, the three pillar align with the UN global level SDGs so that while we are doing the ASEAN 2025 vision, we are concurrently uh, doing the ASEAN, I mean, the global SDG as well. But I'm glad the question was asked because ultimately what makes for a strong community and ASEAN is a community, not a, a union, unlike the European Union. Uh, it's a community. There must be a sense of uh, popular participation and there must be a sense of popular uh, uh, ownership in the process as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you uh, Dr. Natalia Gawa, for joining us uh, today. I strongly apologize once again to all of uh, the participants whose questions were not raised out loud in the discussion but please rest assured that we collected all of them carefully and directed to uh dr natalie gawa beforehand uh it's just the time constraint uh, which prevented us from addressing all of them but it also indicates that we still have uh more other things to discuss and uh an indication of the topic which is resonates very deeply among the audience in Russia, in Southeast Asia, and far beyond this time, uh, these two areas uh, and regions. Uh, please, could all the participants turn on their cameras, if you can, and we will do a group photo. Uh, that's our pandemic um, habit, which we acquired, but also a good memory of today's event for all of you. We will do several shots, so please don't uh, turn do not turn off the cameras and then you will find yourself as internet stars on SCN Center's <laughs> website. Okay. So thank you and uh, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Natalie Gawa for spending this Jakarta afternoon and Moscow morning with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Kordinova. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we, thank you for we stop uh, yeah, our Marty. event here. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. I'll, I'll excuse myself now. Goodbye. Goodbye.